Good evening and welcome to The Woman Show. I'm Lenina Rasul. Tonight we're going to be speaking about gender-based violence and the media, and specifically looking at how GBV is reported on and also the interactions between journalists and victims and survivors of GBV. Later in the show, we're going to be joined by Caroline Peters and Lynn Hill, who are both survivors and have spent a lot of time in the media telling their stories and also advocating against GBV. But before that, we're going to hear from someone who had a negative experience with the media after a trauma and hear how that affected her. Let's have a listen. On the first day of Women's Month, Sunday, the 1st of August 2021, 93-year-old Cynthia Dubell was found brutally murdered in her home in Valville South. A few days later, the family reached out to the community human rights defenders to express their shock and pain at the inaccurate reporting on the death of their 93-year-old mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. Speaking on behalf of the family, Dubell's granddaughter, Anika Dubell, said that the reporting was inaccurate and disrespectful to her grandmother. In a press release to the media, she described how the family was contacted by journalists on the same day her grandmother was found. And while the family asked for more time to respond so they could process what had happened, the response by one journalist was that the community has its own version of events and that will be what is circulated. In particular, Various articles stated that the 93-year-old Cynthia Dubell lived alone, which was not true. Anika added that the reporting by the media had pained the family, but that they did not want the brutal crime to overshadow the legacy of her grandmother. Caroline Peters, coordinator of the Community Human Rights Defenders, condemned the insensitive reporting by various publications. She said that the treatment of families by journalists in the aftermath of a tragedy is disrespectful and often causes secondary trauma to the victims. Good afternoon everyone. Today I'm at 774 Damage Road in Bowhood South where 93 year old Cynthia Dobell was raped and murdered. Today the family and friends, close family and friends are remembering her. The 25 year old accused who lived in the house with her was arrested and is appearing at Balbo Magistrate Court on Thursday morning. We are going to take a short break and we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show and tonight we are speaking about gender-based violence and the media. 
and specifically looking at how the media reports on gender-based violence and also how journalists and other media treat victims, survivors, and the families of gender-based violence. So joining me in, in studio to unpack this is Lynn Hill, who is a survivor, an author, a speaker, and a coach, and who also does a lot of media advocacy around gender-based violence and her experience and the experiences of other women in the sector. And also joining me is Caroline Peters, who is also a survivor, has also had to deal with media during her work, is the founder of the Callis Foundation that assists victims and survivors of domestic violence and other forms of violence. Welcome, ladies, and thank you thank for joining you. us. Thank you. I'm so honored to have both of you here. And what I wanted to bring forward is also that both of you are also survivors of very violent, brutal crimes perpetrated in your youth. And those crimes also garnered a lot of media attention back then. So it's speaking not just sort of from an activist perspective, but it's also speaking from personal experience and how that media attention <coughs> affected both of you at the time. So I'm going to start sort of with a general question, and maybe Lynn, you could go first, and Caroline, you could go second, just to, to open up the conversation and say, you know, at the time when those things occurred, um, how, as a, as a young teenage girl, how did it affect you to see, first of all, that there was widespread reporting on this, on this crime, this brutal crime against you, um, that people knew about it? Because there's two issues to it. There's just seeing your story splashed across all of these pages. And then secondly, also, your interaction with the media at the time. Were they, because we're going to speak about that, were they respectful of your status as someone that has been through something, did they understand that when they were speaking to you or your family, that they were speaking to traumatized people? Um, Lynn, what was that like for you? Okay, so in my case, um, my story landed on the front page of a pretty sensationalist community newspaper without an interview and without my parents or my consent. I was 15, so I was a minor. The misrepresentation was of such that my parents actually threatened to take them to court and they then needed to withdraw. So the misrepresentation was just, it was skewed to a point where I was cheapened to a point that um, I was protected from it. My parents never let me read it. Um, I think I was too numb at that point to even, because this was just weeks later. So I was still trying to get, make sense of what had gone down. So I never quite saw it, but what it did do for me, Lenina, it actually inspired me to reclaim my reputation. And I think a part of taking it through, right through to conviction, um, through the judicial system, was yes, I wanted justice and I wanted the perpetrator to be jailed, but I think I also wanted justice for my reputation um, and to correct that. So it was just sensationalist, it was disrespectful, um, there was just no acknowledgement of the level of trauma. And I mean, that in itself is an injustice having to, just the fact that you were judged, that there was Absolutely. a re reputation to reclaim but yes. we do know that not just in media, but in general, that women are asked and judged about what were you wearing, Absolutely. why were you where, where you were at that time. Absolutely. Caroline, what was your experience and like? I know, you know, for many, for, so, so for, for a lot of survivors, um, Lenina, I know that already you feel the shame, the guilt. One of the things, I was also 15. And for me, there, was, there, there were no media at the time. I must just correct that to you. There were no media at the time, and, but remember what we call the, um, the, the community media. Mm -hmm. So news spread fast. I lived in a community where if something happens, everybody knows. Mm -hmm. I stopped attending the school that I went to because then I was looked again. Mm -hmm. so, so there was no media at the time. So, you know, often we say it's only the media, but it's not just the media. You know, when you live in a community, if we live in a township, let's say I lived in a township, 
And in townships, the, the township newspaper at that time was just as well, you know? Mm. The blaming, the why, why were we on the field? We know we're not supposed to walk over the field. And mm. remember in my mm. case also, my friend was killed, and if it wasn't for me, that wouldn't have happened, you know? Um, mm. I took her along with me. So all that guilt uh, that, 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 that you walk around with at the time, so when, I, when this happened to me in 1980, there was no media. Um, and, and I'm actually glad that, that, that it wasn't. But sometimes I also feel, was it not that important? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, and, and Lenina, to be quite honest, mm -hmm. I don't even know if there was media, and I don't want to remember. Mm -hmm. um, because now that, that you mentioned that, that's also interesting to me. And, and that it wasn't reported that on. That it wasn't reported on. And that's something, Lynn, you and yeah. I touched on actually yes. in conversation. So for me, what was interesting, um, Caroline and Lenina, was the media were so quick to focus on, on all of the sensational mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. But there was no media when I could victoriously walk out of mm. the Supreme Court. Mm. That is very interesting. Yes. There was no validation mm. of a very emotionally strenuous, almost debilitating journey that I mm. had to travel mm. in over 10 months. Because mm. remember, this individual mm. came out on 500 Rand bail mm. when I came out of, of deep sedation 72 mm. hours later. He lived in the same community. Mm. When the case was shifted from the regional court to the Supreme Court, I was grateful, but that was three additional months of hell. Mm. So I had gone through all of this to speak out for those whom he had allegedly raped before me. The fact that he was also a member of my church um, contributed mm. to what mm. Caroline alluded to earlier, that hectic judge mentality. Mm whose side are you on, which mm. family side are you on. So there was that faction to deal with as well, which I was unable to deal with as a 15-year-old. Mm. But the judgment, that is a persecution in itself. That is secondary victimization mm. in itself. Mm. What I call, Caroline, that, that irrational blame and shame. Mm. You don't know why you're feeling it, but you're feeling it. Mm. Mm. And, and, and it's irrational because you are not to blame for this. Mm. You have actually been violated so deeply. So where was the media when he actually was convicted? Mm. He didn't get 25 years. I was promised mm. that. So the system failed me. He only got 10. Mm. But where was the media? Why did they not report on the victory and the justice? And the fact that if it I, was 10 years instead of 25 you know, years even. Yes. 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 But, but for me, a, a, I always say a conviction is a conviction, whether you went to prison for a year or 10 years. And I know as a survivor we want life, um, but for me that in itself is a victory. Because if we look at conviction rates and successful conviction rates, 7%. Well, we flit, yes. Lynn and I were discussing this, and we're flitting between, you know, the Medical Research Council yes. had 8.6% in mm. 2017 they reported on. We've seen roughly 10%, mm. roughly 14% here and there. Yeah, the I don't, I, I say it's probably between 7 and 8%. I, you know, if you look at the reported cases and then you look at successful yeah. convictions. But I just want to add to that, you know, one of the things that, that victims walk or survivors or walk around with it, if only, if only, yeah. um, Lynn uh, just, just touched on, 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 on the guilt that you feel, the shame that you feel. If only, you know, um, if only I didn't do this, if only I didn't do that, how could I have, you know, so, so that in itself says that. If I look at the case with the Doval case that we just had on the 1st of August. Yes, but Caroline, I want you yes. to actually, just to, for context, for our viewers, yes. um, there was a case. Uh, a 93-year-old woman, Cynthia Dubell, was found raped and murdered in her home in Balmul South, Cape Town, on the 1st of August, which is the beginning of Women's Day. And Caroline was approached by the family for two reasons, for, assist, for general assistance around this issue, but also to help them deal with the media coverage of this horrendous crime, which was causing them also a lot of trauma. So, Caroline, maybe you can speak about what some of that media coverage was. So, on the 1st of August, 
um, Sensei Jobal passed away, um, passed or died two o'clock this morning, the, 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 the early hours of the morning around two, that's what we've just heard. But I mean, the, the family then later in that morning discovered her uh, and, and that. So on that day, after the family discovered, and, and you know how quickly the community newspapers are on the scene. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were there, um, they got there after um, Cynthia Dubal left the home, um, the, the family was still at the scene. The reporter then called one of the family members and asked, asked her what happened and asked her for more details and there's voice notes and SMSs, you know, and she said to them, we're not ready to speak to you. Because you can re imagine, it's a 93-year-old grandmother that they've just lost so brutally on the begin at the beginning of, of, of um, Women's Month and the perpetrator is, is, is a family member, you know? So it was, it, it was heavy to deal with on that day. And so um, one, why I said that if only, you know, and that granddaughter said to me, if only I fetched my mom the day before, mm -hmm. you know? So how, how already that was trauma to her. And then the media report comes out and she says to the media man, I, I'm not ready to speak to you, call me tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And he says, they want to report on it tomorrow. But the family wasn't ready. So, of course, they made up their own version. Yes. And he says to her, I'm going to speak to the neighbor. Mm. You know? Um, but the neighbor, yes, won't so have, have, their own yes, or have their own version. So the, 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 the neighbor then speaks to, to um, it is reported the next day that Cynthia Dobell lived by herself. So, of course, when it hit the media, all the community see and everybody sees us that. This was a lonely old woman, family didn't care about her, so it was the story of this old woman who lives by herself that is not taken care of, that was raped and murdered, which was not true. So again, that was very traumatic to the family, mm -hmm. because then they felt, if only we had our grandmother with us, if only we mm -hmm. did this, you know? So the guilt around that came up again. So why didn't we force her to come and live with us? The grandmother, as we all know, grandmothers and mothers are like that. I will mm. die in this house. No, you must mm. carry me out of my home. Mm. You know, and, and, and that's what happened in this case. They, we've seen the evidence of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the perpetrator. In fact, his mother was the caregiver. She was paid to be the caregiver. In that week, there's evidence of monies being paid to her, of groceries, of electricity being bought for her. So there was a caregiver for, for um, Cynthia Dobell, you know? But what it said, again, that was very traumatic to the family. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the information that went out with the initial statement. Even I shared it when I saw it the, the Monday just before the family the contacted me. I shared that incorrect article mm -hmm. because that is what I do. I, I highlight um, incidences of gender-based violence in the media. And so, of course, the family then contacts me later in the day. Someone else contacts me and says, the family would like to, to speak to you, the right person. And so that's how I get involved with this case. Um, so again, you know, and it was very traumatic. I think only by the Friday, we corrected that article. We sent out a press release with your assistance we could send out a press release after you interviewed the family and then by then the family was too scared to speak to any media person yes and i i assured them that you know you will be sensitive to the matter we will you know and and yeah so that was the first time the family actually spoke to media so anything that the media reported on before then was just purely sensational mm. look before before we said the rape and murder, the, the media only said murdered. And then, of course, now, I mean, I had someone that contact, contacted me yesterday. Where can they find the post-mortem mortem report? A journalist. For this case? For this case, mm -hmm. yes. And, and that, to me, was interesting. You know, and I think, why do you want the post-mortem case? What is the post-mortem post case? got to do with, with, with what we're doing or where we're at. Or in the public's interest. Or in the public's interest, you know. 
even I mean, I said to the to, to the granddaughter, I said to to uh, um, at court last week when when um, with a bail hearing, she said to me she wants to see the post mortem. I said. We've heard from the investigating officer, he's given you the report. You don't want to read a physical report, Annika. You're not ready for this. Mm. Let, let it go for now. We will get there when you are ready to read this book. Because you must remember already the family's not sleeping, not eating, and all those things that goes with trauma. Yeah. So, um, and now a journalist contacts me to ask where can they get hold of the postmortem. What does it, you know, what good is it going to be? What do you, yeah. Yeah, and it you know what really I think is interesting is that, um, you know, this, this sort of almost overemphasis on reporting. And I don't want to take away, we need more reporting on gender-based violence. Statistics have shown mm. that there's very mm. little. Um, one of the, you know, one of the reasons also that the show was started was to address the gap in the reporting on gender-based violence. Mm. But also, when we're looking at the increased reporting during Women's Month, um, and I'm just saying the candid way that you are asked for the post-mortem, mm. what are the reasons for it? Mm. We often see also in activist groups, do you, it's like the story leads um, who they're going to get. Do you have a rape survivor that can speak to me? Yes. You know, as if, yes. do you know someone whose yes. car was stolen? Yes. Mm. Or um, yeah. some, do you have a rape survivor? Is there, is there a family of a, of a femicide that can just come and tell yes. us their story? Yes. Um, and then were you interviewed at, or just like at any point directly by journalists? And you've had over the years, though, I think both you and Caroline mm. have later, as mm. you've become activists, have you, as you've um, become more visible survivors, and, and I will say, to, you speak out for the many women who can't. Mm. Mm. You know, you're representative of many voices of women who can't because, because of the shame and because mm. of the blame. Still, it doesn't matter how many years have passed, I yes. come into contact with women all the time who will disclose, sometimes for the first time after they've seen a show, that this happened to me and I never told anybody. Mm. Mm. So, these, so your voices are very important. Yes. Um, but over the years, as you have been interviewed, so I'm going to ask first, what has that experience has been like for you being interviewed by journalists? Or you, Caroline, you also spoke about now, you know, the specific interaction with the journalist um, or the media and the family and their sort of attitude, I guess, is something I could say. Have, have issues like that come up over the years? Yes, definitely. Yeah, if, you if, I, if, if, if I can just, you know, over the years, I think I've told my story and I'm not exaggerating, probably 200 times on different platforms, on to groups, to media. But just specifically, and I'll never forget, heart was P4 when I told my story the first time. I was accompanied by Benita Woolman. She was from Red Crisis. She's now the doctor, Benita Woolman. But she was the coordinator for Red Crisis. And I was a Red Crisis volunteer at the time, working at Saki Batman Center, but it's a network. And she said to me, I think you're ready to tell your story publicly. And I said to her, I can't. And she said, but I will be right there. Mm. And so we off we go. And I remember I was off sick the next day. Oh. No, no, you know what I mean. I, I needed a day in mm. bed. I needed a day to hide. I needed a day to. And that was the first time. And so after that, it became easier. Not easier. There's sometimes we, we, when you're telling your story, you thought, oh, I'm just going to go there, tell my story another day. But then the tears flow and it becomes emotional. And I think journalists push you to the point where they want to see emotions. They do not want to speak to a survivor that tells their story in a, in a, in a victorious way. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they want to see a survivor that's sitting there, um, falling, apart. falling apart, shoulders, and, and, and so I, because I'm smart, I've picked up on that over the years, and yes. I sometimes, even though I feel that, I will not show that. Caroline, I'm so sorry to break your word, but we need to go to a break quickly, and we'll be back with more after this.
Welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show, and we are speaking about gender-based violence and the way it is reported on, as well as the way that the media interacts with survivors and the families of those who have been affected by gender-based violence. And joining me is Caroline Peters, who is the founder of the Callis Foundation and is also a survivor of violence, and Lynn Hill, who is the author of Butterfly, My Soul Got Wings. She's also a survivor, a coach, a public speaker. Um, and so, ladies, we were before the break, we were speaking about your personal interactions with the media over the years as survivors who have bravely come out and started telling your stories, being a voice for the many, many, many survivors we know who can't speak out about it. For many people, I think, who are also, if not directly affected by it, that know people who are affected by it. Mm -hmm. And Caroline, you were speaking about, for, for example, the family of 93-year-old Cynthia Dubell, who was found murdered, raped and murdered um, at the beginning of Women's Month, mm. and how the family experienced real secondary trauma um, as a result of the reporting. And mm. I also would like to explain that secondary trauma is trauma that is inflicted on the survivor or other people okay. after the fact, so not mm. directly mm. from what's mm. happened to mm. us, it is our interactions later, later. on with people. Mm. And themes that have come up in the conversation especially is blame, mm. and as a result of blame there's often deep shame. Mm. Um, and it's interesting for me, who's also a survivor and very strangely and coincidentally was also 15, mm. um, and I had opened the door to someone. Um, and I remember in the very immediate aftermath, even before I reported, I, one of the things that flitted into my mind was they are going to ask me why I opened the door to a stranger. This is something they taught from very young. But I remember that and I remember feeling, um, and it's insane if I think about it now, I remember feeling deep fear about that judgment. That, uh, they, that they're going to judge me about doing such a stupid thing. And, and in fact, that, that is not central to the story or important mm, to the story at all, because we should live in a world where we can yes. open the door. We should live in a world where we can walk across the field mm. or in a park at any time of night. We speak mm. about this all the time. Mm. Women mm. want to feel mm. safe, mm. but we are not. But I just want to come back, Adeline. So you were speaking about you know, your interactions with journalists and how some of them actually want you to break mm. down, that you have felt mm. pushed to the point. Yes. So you can stand there as a strong person, Lynn, you said you didn't, want to be, you, you didn't want to be identified as sort of mm. a pitiful victim, mm. you mm. wanted to come forth as someone, as an overcomer, mm. as yes. a victor, mm. um, and yet mm. they'll push you, mm. you know, to mm. cry to or, cry to, or so to forth. show emotions and that. I just I, want to, sorry, you know, I just, just as we were breaking now, I, I thought of I get called by Anika Dobal, the, the granddaughter. She says to me, the media is coming, but I want you to come, you know? And so I get there, but the media, she says to the media, speak to me, but they're not interested to speak to me. And I watched her at this media interview where she's falling apart, mm -hmm. you know? And I thought, now what good does that make to your news? Mm -hmm. You know, because she's babbling because she's distraught. Mm. So she literally sits there and falls apart. And I mean, I sat next to her on, in the interview, um, away from her because she's on camera, you know, trying to hold space away for her. And all I thought was, is this what you wanted? Mm. You know, to see this young woman fall apart because of a granny. They were not interested to interview me on behalf who could of the give family, them the info, who all the could same give them all the same even information, better. even in a better manner, but they wanted to see Here that, go. you know, and and that made, after that day, I, I don't want to, you know, say the names, but I thought of, sure, you're not, you mainstream media, you're not the little Kuranchi community paper that comes here and do this, this is mainstream media. So what is it about the media that want to see us? And then after they left, I sat there counseling us. Yeah. You know? So 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 it's um yeah. Um Liz, you were going to say also yeah. in terms of your experience. I think it it, it boils it 
really boils down to what is the agenda. Mm. And Caroline saying now, you know, it was mainstream media and it wasn't some community um, media. But the one is no excuse or justification mm. for the other. Media is media. So what is the agenda? Um, and, and very often um, they sitting with their own agenda. Um, where I, just a few weeks ago, I, I was part of an interview and um, five days after the photo shoot, after the interview, National um, uh, Magazine, I get called and I get asked um, about the rape at 15. So two things came out of that, about the rape at 15. Can you give us the individual's name? So one and a half hours of interview, another one and a half hours of photo shoot, mm. three vested hours of my time already, which I'm not paid for, by the way, mm. never paid mm. for, by the way. Um, five days after that, I get this call out of nowhere. Um, his name, when you were 15, his name and surname, please. The date of the court, please. Um, 39 years later, we actually need to check that there was a conviction. Mm. Because if there was not a conviction, then we're not going to publish your story. Oh, wow. Mm. That for me was, I tell you, Lenina and Caroline, I was flattened. Mm. I was deflated. I had a sense of, you got to be freaking kidding me. Mm. So you take me through that detail, which mm. I now, mm. I relive, and you want the detail, and I give you the detail, you tell me, uh, share what you're comfortable with. Mm. But you're also asking me questions related yes, to that detail. Yes, yes. So there's that dubiousness. Mm. Um, you then say to me, after you asking me for that, you say, um, uh, we're only also going to report and f emphasize the conviction, mm. the convicted rape. Mm. Um, we're not going to go into your second rape because there was no conviction. Mm. So what is your agenda? Why don't you go into why there was no conviction? Mm. Because what would have come mm. out of that particular story is a fallibility, mm. an increased fallibility of a system mm. in terms of police attitude, mm. which is secondary victimization because mm -hmm. attitudes and omissions form part of it. Mm -hmm. So you had the attitude of the police mm. um, in... in, in can't even remember the, the area in Johannesburg now. And you also had the absence of a rape kit mm. beyond that mm. attitude. Um, Four Ways Medi Clinic had no rape kit. Mm. Why are Medi Clinics not accessing rape kits? So you went there, but there was no rape kit? No rape kit, but I went there because I was, I was being treated for severe shock to a point of, of you know, getting a stroke. Um, but there was no rape kit to even then almost fill the gap in between yeah, the non-cooperative police. So again, you're not going into, because you've got a certain agenda of what you want to report on mm. when it comes to my life. And, and, and this is why we spoke about conviction mm. rates. So if you're only focusing on women's stories where there has been proven conviction, mm -hmm. what does it say about the level that even we as empowered individuals, because media actually mm -hmm. sees themselves mm -hmm. as empowered individuals and in touch with current reality, what does it say about your attitude towards those who actually don't reach conviction? Mm. And we would know what it takes to reach conviction, that it's not that someone doesn't report it. It is on technicality that stuff gets thrown out. Um, so what about the other stories? Why are we only hearing stories where there is conviction? That is minimization of trauma just there. That is you literally saying to a victim of trauma, your story doesn't count because it's not dramatic enough. I know of production companies where detail was required in such a way mm. that I was said, Lynn, give us as much detail for sound effects. Sure. And um, the sound effects happened and, and the television program happened and is still happening. There's, there are very many repeats. 
but I also know victims who were not shortlisted for that particular channel because they were drug raped. So there was no sound effect. And that is harsh. That is harsh. That is harsh. That, I believe, is another level of social injustice just there. I want to ask you, Lynn, because I was, you know, I am a journalist. And I want to ask you, when you got the, the call, I think, just asking about to verify the convictions, because I understand that's what they were doing. But was it the same person that you interacted with during the shoot? Because I would think from a logical perspective. So one, from a logical perspective, if I were doing a story, but also second, to take actions to minimize, to understand that actually a survivor coming onto your show to tell their story is a traumatic, uh, is a traumatic process. So one, to understand that. Mm. And the second thing, how, what can I do to minimize the trauma for the survivor is do your verification up front. Absolutely. Understand what you mm. need to get out of this article up front. Be uh, transparent. Absolutely. And actually have some conversations before the time so that you know what to expect. And I, and I will say that I have had, I've been in contact with both of you the whole week for us to sort of unpack yeah. what are we going to discuss here, what you're comfortable with and not comfortable with. Um, but you see, Lenina, media do not understand secondary trauma. So you would have the journalist and then the producer, whoever else is part of that show. Like if it's your show, you call me, you speak to me, you, you know. There's no more than, so with other people, there'll be two, three people involved in your story. And, and telling your story, it's, it's very personal, it's very intimate. And I don't think, because you stand on a stage telling people, I've stood on stage telling hundreds of people my story, but then I, I look at one face, and I'm going to tell you, I look at one face in, in, the, in the crowd, and that's where I, I speak to. And I almost have to prepare myself mentally and emotionally and block out all the other faces and speak to the one face. Mm. I find, and that's what I've been taught. Find a face in the in the crowd and speak to that person. And that's your way, also. It's, it's my of way being of coping. able to withstand yes. sort of tell, the telling but, of the story yes. again. But now with media, um, there's a whole lot of them, and 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 it's like it's just like you're telling a story, and nobody understands that there's still emotions and feelings involved when you tell your story. There's no person in the room. I mean, that is why when we have storytelling, we have someone in the room that can hold okay. space, okay. that can, so if I, if I, so, so one thing the media has to be aware of, there needs to be someone that is able to support the survivor Absolutely. emotionally. Huh? Mm -hmm. And like I said to you, and so many times you stand and you tell your story, but nobody comes and say, thank you, thank you for telling your story. That must have been hard for you. Acknowledge. Acknowledge that it's not easy, whether it's my 200th time. And that could be the day where I'm not having a good day and I'm going to need someone in that space. But just someone saying to me, thank you for sharing your story. That must have been hard for you. Mm. You know, and, and, and be that, say that. And on that, Caroline, you were speaking about also earlier, you know, your first, your first interview mm -hmm. where you needed a day in bed after. Yes. Lynn, I know you've also spoken about actually afterwards yeah. finding yourself needing a debriefing, mm -hmm. needing something. And that's led to conversations about, well, should we as media, and I include myself, you know, uh, should we as media have resources available to survivors who come on and tell Absolutely. their stories afterwards? Absolutely. Yes. I think the one, the one episode that I went through uh, just flew up to Joburg for a day. This was the episode of production. Mm. So the one that you had asked me was print media, where Caroline had mentioned different players. Mm. So to answer that question, it was the same journalist. Mm. I must also say that I have never, ever been treated intentionally mm. with disrespect mm. Mm. or non-compassion. Mm. And the thing for me about speaking on this platform about secondary trauma is that we need to increase and raise the awareness because mm. some of it is unconscious and unintentional. Yes, yes, yes. Because journalists 
as Caroline rightfully said, don't necessarily understand um, secondary trauma. Mm. And if that is the case, and we as victims are saying that this is a gap, Mm -hmm. then it is a gap that requires responsiveness, constructive responsiveness. So those who, who are in contact with victims then actually need to go on their training. Mm -hmm. But it does not replace the actual fully-fledged psychologist mm -hmm. who needs to be there for purposes of debriefing, yes. especially when you are called as a victim for the level of detail. Mm. So when I got back on that plane, so I had to not go through one rape um, story in detail, I had to go through two. And that was only one, one year after, or a few months after the second rape. Um, and I remember sitting, getting on that plane that night, feeling just flat, mm. Mm -hmm. finished, deflated, mm. asking mm. myself, what the hell was this about? Mm. Um, what are they going to do with this again? Mm. Um, is this actually, so number one, I will, I'm not paid for that entire day mm -hmm. um, as a fully fledged practitioner, professional. Um, and having this person's face in my face, a face mm. that I tried to forget for what? Mm. 37, 38 years, um, having this face in my face. Mm. And then realizing, but my gosh, here I am as a counselor as someone with a background in clinical psychology, mm. and I am struggling. Mm. Oh, and that was, I think mm. that flattened me more. It was a, oh my God moment, if I am struggling and this is yes. the case. And I know even with both of yes. your work that you do in counseling, mm. you guys try, you know, as, as sort of people who do counseling, mm. you try to counsel yourself. Yes. You try, you, you yes. think you can All debrief yourself and you think you're <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it's absolutely. not. Yes. And I think that was my moment of, oh my gosh, this is a development area mm. for mm. not just this production company, but mm. it's a development area for just media that mm. we require debriefing. Yes. And that that needs to be built mm. in mm -hmm. to yes. production budgets, mm. if one mm. wants to call it that. Yes. So you've got production houses and media houses who actually are working with a budget, but the victim is never included in that yeah. budget. Yeah, yeah. And that for me is also economically disempowering. Yeah. Because this is what yeah. we do for a living. You know, I mean, I don't always only speak on trauma, mm, but this mm, is what we do mm, for a living. Mm, and we are advocating for humanity. Yeah. Um, and, and we are worthy. Yes. We are worthy. Uh, we have that conversation all the time. I want to tell you, this reminded me of Alan Puckis, who's speaking about a production. Remember the media around Alan Puckis yes, for a long, a lot. all that. And then so Alan Puckis also, somehow, I get involved with Alan Puckis, and she says, you know, she's really, I mean, she's gone off the media grid, we still chat, we still, but she's just saying no to nothing. She don't do, she does church work. And that. But, but you know, so a media house also phones us phones us, um, SABC, in fact, phones her, and then, of course, at that stage, she now gives my number, and, and I must deal with them. And I call back, I speak to the producer of the show, and no, she cannot bring me work. Mm -hmm. So they want to fly her up, but they want to fly her. She says, if she goes, I go. Mm -hmm. And they say no. And remember, I'm a support. So they, 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 they will organize it from that side. You know, someone to be there. It's not the same. So by this stage, I know the story. I've walked mm. with her for a bit and that. Mm. So she trusts, she trusts me. She says, if she goes up to Joburg, I go with her. Mm. And, 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 and they say, no, there's no budget for that. And I say, look, by this stage, I'm saying, Alan Puckies is poor. She was not paid for a movie that mm. was made, you know, and, and, and things like that. Just what stood out for me was that, as a support, they said there was no, no, no budget for that. So again, mm. you know, you, 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 you were asking, should the media houses have a budget for support? Yes. For the survivors that they interview, and and they said no, and they said no. Look, they can't pay her, but they can fly her up by herself, and they'll make sure there's. So I will say, for even that. for me, you know, the the notion of a budget for support is is fun and it's new. Mm. But it doesn't mean it should be dismissed. Yes. Ladies, we need to take a short break again quickly. We're going to be back with more after this.
welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show and we are speaking about gender-based violence in the media, the way the media reports and how they interact with survivors and families of gender-based violence. And we are taking last words from Caroline Peters and Lynn Hill who have joined us to speak about their experiences with the media around cases of gender-based violence. Um, and I think, Lynn, I'm going to start with you. Any last words, suggestions? Sure. Um, I think just to mention that I tell my story so that others can be empowered by it, so that they are able to draw strength from it, so that they're able to draw a boldness from it. But we have to get to a point of what's our next. So the recycling of a story is really not going to address gender-based violence in a systemic way. And if media can begin to play more of a solutions-based role um, in advocating for the systemic solution to not just gender-based violence, but just to um, equilibrating power, that would be absolutely phenomenal. What we do require is a greater level of sensitivity. And again, um, I spoke just now of the unconscious um, fact that you know, uh, they, they're not intentional in, in putting us through secondary trauma, but to become empowered about what secondary trauma really is and to address those gaps. And then also just for victim support. Um, if you're wanting our stories, just give us the support. Give us the economic support we need. We actually need to use our cars to get to interviews as one of the most basic needs. <laughs> so there's that, but most importantly, that psychological support. Um, Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, sure. Just, I, I, I also want to echo what um, Lynn just said. You know, for me, I tell my story to give other women permission to share theirs. Many platforms you come on, I mean, my 73-year-old sister shared her story after I told my story you know, um, in this year, and that to me was huge. Mm -hmm. So we tell our story to give others permission to do that, but we also need the media to be sensitive around it. And I think if we want to dismantle GBV, we need a whole society approach. And we need the media. The media plays a huge mm -hmm. part. If we look at what happened last week with the reporting on the teenage rapes, they, not the rapes, it should be teenage rapes. Yes and not teenage pregnancies, because 10 to 14 year old girls pregnant, teenage pregnant, is statutory rape. And 934 of them in Gauteng, 314 of them in the Western Cape. So the headline says teenage pregnancies, it should read teenage rapes. You know, so, so the way the media, the words the media use, the, what the headlines, and that is what we need to sensitize the media also around. And then, of course, when it comes to GBV survivors and their families, that we're sensitive, that we do not go for the story and, and, and that, but that we make sure the media can know how to hold space because they, are, they should be a safe space to report um, gender-based violence. Yes, and I think that might be also a call to the media in general. I think I, I really like what you said, Len, in terms of it not being intentional. Mm. And so mm. we're not here and having yes. this conversation to blame anybody yes. and blame any journalists. But I think the call is the same as the call has been to police, to the justice mm. system, to Caroline. You mentioned the community as well yes. and the way that they speak about mm. I will say Skinner, yes. <laughs> but I'm just saying the way the stories are carried, even in communities, and the way all of us interact with survivors of gender-based violence. Yes. And with that, that brings us to the end of the show. I want to thank you so very much for coming and participating in this uh, very important conversation. Um, thank you very much for watching. I'm Lenina Rasul. Good night. Mm -hmm.